Well, good morning, folks. How you doing? Praise the Lord. Christmas Sunday. Can you believe it? It's amazing to me. Um, in some ways, it seems like this has been the longest year of our lives. And in some ways, I can't hardly believe that it's Christmas Sunday already and the year's almost gone. But here we are. Crazy. Um, you know, I was really looking forward to us hopefully being able to get together this morning in live service, but COVID-19 being what it is, of course we're not able to, but that's okay. We can still celebrate the Lord together and uh, celebrate His birth. And uh, we have a lot to be thankful for. You know, I really believe if you listen to all the prophetic voices around the nation that God's got some awesome things ahead for His church. I believe God's Spirit is on the move and we're going to see a mighty revival and I am really excited about it. Good things ahead, folks. Good things ahead. Better days. Amen. <laughs> Sounds awesome. Well, I want to talk to you today uh, about the Lord's birth. And uh, I'm going to do that by talking to you about the different pieces of the manger scene. Never done that before. But uh, I feel like that's the Lord uh, wanting me to talk to you about it that way today. So that's what we're going to do. But First of all, if I asked each one of you, you know, what you like about Christmas, I think we could be here all day long, because many of you would agree with that song, it's the most wonderful time of the year. A lot of us love Christmas season, and it's just a really neat time to celebrate family and friends, but more than anything, to celebrate what Christ has done for us by coming as a babe so that he could be the ultimate sacrifice so that we could be with him for all of eternity. But um, I, I'm like the rest of you, I love Christmas. Jackie and I both, we love Christmas and we're suckers for Christmas tradition. We love all that stuff. We developed many wonderful Christmas traditions of our own. We like watching the old Christmas movies. A lot of you tend to watch the newer ones. Jackie and I, we tend to watch the older Christmas movies. I don't know, there's just something real nostalgic about that, you know. It's a wonderful life. Teacher says every time a bell rings, an angel gets his wings and all that good stuff. We like to watch Miracle on 34th Street, Holiday Inn, The Bells of St. Mary's, The Preacher's Wife on Moonlight Bay and on Silvery Moon, and uh, the 12 Days of the Christmas. Now, the 12 Days of Christmas, the version that we have, you may have never seen. That's special to us, not because of the story, but because of who gave us the movie. Um, Jean Doris and Amy Galati gave us that movie years ago. It was their tradition to watch that movie together and they made us a part of their tradition. And we went to their house and watched that movie and just had a blast. And so we've made that a part of our tradition. So we carry on that tradition and we watch it every year. It's just really a funny version of that movie. Jackie and I like putting up the Christmas trees, you know, like many of you do. and. We have our favorite ornaments that we put on every year. Um, some of you may have heard this story, I don't know, but uh, Jackie and I's first Christmas together, um, you know, every year as kids, we would get the Christmas tree, go up in the attic, get the ornaments, put them on, it was a great time. And so we were looking first forward to having our own first Christmas tree as a couple when we first got married. And we went out and we got the tree and we put it up and then we realized we couldn't go to the attic and get the ornaments. We didn't have any ornaments. And at the time, we were both working for a minimum wage, and so we couldn't really afford to go get ornaments because we had just gotten Christmas presents. And uh, so we were pretty stretched at that point. So we were like, what are we going to do for ornaments? We have a tree with no ornaments on it. That's going to be sad. So um, we're both pretty creative. So we went out to a craft store, and we got all kinds of little things to make ornaments, and we made our Christmas ornaments, and they only cost pennies, but to this day, those ornaments are special to us because they were our very first Christmas ornaments, and we made them with our own two hands. But um, we also have um, ornaments that, you know, people gave us, and they're special to us for those reasons. We have ornaments that are special because of where we purchased them. You know, we got them on special vacations, that sort of thing, places that are really special to us. One of the ornaments that we have that's the most special to us, or at least one of the most special, is it goes back to that first Christmas. Um, we had no Christmas ornaments except one. Someone, bless their heart, 
um, who's with the Lord right now. Her name is Sherry. Um, she, for our Christmas, or for a wedding present, got us a Christmas ball that said, Our First Christmas Together. So that was the only real Christmas ornament that we had. So we put all of these ornaments all over our tree that we made, and we had one real Christmas ornament. So since we only had one, we put a hook on it, and we both held onto the hook, and we put that ornament front and center of the tree. That was the very first Christmas that we had together. And every Christmas since then, because we've made that a tradition, we put that Christmas ball on a hook, and together we hook that ornament onto the tree. And that's a very special time for us. And so um, that's special to us because it goes clear back to that first Christmas together. But there are other things um, that are special to us that are traditions as far as Christmas. We have um, a set of white doves that Jackie's mom gave to Jackie and I for a Christmas or a wedding present when we got married. And uh, it's an awesome wedding present and it's been special to us for all these years for many reasons. Um, most of all because Jackie's mom gave it to us. Um, you know, she said, your dad's doing something special to you in that he is doing your wedding ceremony because he was a pastor. And she said, I want to do something special myself for you. So she gave us those white turtle doves. And so it's special because she gave it to us for our wedding, but also because of what it represents. White turtle doves, um, they mate for life. Um, and sometimes even goes beyond their lifetime together because there have been white turtle doves that have been seen that have been watching over their deceased mate. Even though their mate was deceased, they were still trying to tend to that mate and care for that mate. Um, and they always return to the place where uh, their mate died. And so um, their love goes deep. And so that's another reason why those white turtle doves are special to us. Another thing that is really special to us is a manger scene that we have. And of course the manger scene is special and for obvious reasons because it reminds us of what Christ did to it for us. But this one is really special to us because my mom made it for Jackie and I for Christmas many years ago. And uh, she said, I want you to have something that I made with my own two hands. So she painted this manger scene and uh, gave it to Jackie and I for Christmas and like the white turtle doves that Jackie's mom gave us this manger scene that my mom gave us is priceless um, I have no idea how much uh, money she put into it but it's worth all the money in the world to me because she made it with her own two hands and I'll always cher cherish that and every year we put it up in a special place of honor um, to remember what the Lord did for us and we're very careful you know we have many many layers wrapping each individual piece of the manger scene so that nothing happens to it and we put it in a place where it's seen by everyone and um, you know whenever I put that manger scene out um, I don't just you know put it up willy-nilly I put it up very carefully and I think about each piece of the manger scene and as I'm putting that piece out, um, I try to put it in a place where it'll be seen the best and where it makes the most sense in the manger scene story, you know, where this person would be standing. And I even take it another step. When I'm putting each individual piece of the manger up, I think about that person in the story and what that first Christmas must have been like for that person you know, with their story and their history and everything that was coming into the story for that person. And so um, that's kind of what I want to do today whenever I talk to you about the major scene is what, what was that story like for them and what did it represent for them? Now, if I asked each of you what you think about Christmas, when I say the word Christmas, I'm sure we get all kinds of different answers. But one of the things that um, I'm sure would come to your mind when you say the word Christmas is peace on earth. Um, you know, we think about peace on earth, goodwill to all men. And um, apparently I'm not the only one who thinks about peace on earth when I think about Christmas time. Um, if you've ever followed the comic strip Peanuts, 
There was always animosity between Charlie Brown and Lucy. And in one episode, Lucy comes to Charlie Brown and she says, Merry Christmas, Charlie Brown. This is the season of peace on earth and goodwill toward men. Therefore, I suggest we forget all about our differences and love one another. And Charlie Brown's face just lights up like a Christmas tree. And he says, that's great, Lucy. But can't we continue to do this all year long? And Lucy replies, what are you, nuts? <laughs> I guess um, for her, peace on earth at Christmas time was good enough. I don't know. But um, there's an old Christmas special that Jackie and I watch each year. That is an episode of the Jackie Gleason Show. Now that's really going back, way back. And some of you might remember the movie The Honeymooners. Some of you that are listening, you're like, Honeymooners, whatever. You have no idea what I'm talking about. But those of you that are my age and older would remember Honeymooners. And uh, in that movie, um, Ralph uh, was um, a bus driver in New York City, which I'm sure was not a peaceful job to have. But he talks in this one episode about how things are just different at Christmas time. Uh, the hustle and bustle of the city seems to slow down a little bit and people were a little more kind and a little more gentle and a little more loving and basically what he's going back to is peace on earth. And uh, I'd like to show you a clip of that but I'm sure I'd get flagged if I did that because of you know, copyrights with YouTube and all that sort of thing, but if you want to see it, just um, go to YouTube and put The Honeymooners Christmas, and I'm sure you'll be able to see that clip, but it's really funny. Anyway, um, I remember reading a story about World War I, and uh, really, really a neat story. It talks about how on Christmas Eve, I think it was 1914, um, the British troops were in trenches, and they were crouched in these trenches. They were about, if I remember right, three feet deep, three feet wide. Miserable, cold, wet, damp. You can imagine what it was like. Um, you know, they were covered in mud. Bless their hearts, I'm sure these men were wondering if they were ever going to see home again or family again. And all of a sudden, about 10 p.m., across the field, they start to hear this sound. It almost sounded like voices. And the closer they listened, they were the sounds of singing. And they realized that they were Christmas carols. And here these British soldiers were listening to German soldiers that were singing Christmas carols. And the next thing they knew, German soldiers invited them to come over to where they were on Christmas Eve. And the British said, um, you come halfway. I mean, you can imagine how scary that would have been for them. And um, so that's what they did. The German soldiers got out of their trenches and came halfway. The British soldiers got out of their trenches, came halfway. And they basically met in no man's land. And uh, here they were. Now realize, this is World War II. And as the story played out, there were German, British, French, and Belgian soldiers all coming together on this battlefield and together singing in their different languages Christmas carols on Christmas Eve. Imagine that. Um, they started to talk to one another and laugh with one another. Uh, stories go that some of them started to play soccer together. Um, they used candles and put on wild Christmas, wild trees there in the battle area and lit them as Christmas trees. And these were men who just a few hours ago were trying to kill each other and now all of a sudden here they are on Christmas Eve laying all their differences aside, laying all of that aside and celebrating Christmas Eve together. What a magical time that must have been. And I read this one little clip from a German soldier. It says, and this is him uh, speaking. How marvelously wonderful, yet how strange it was. The English officers felt the same way about it. Thus Christmas, the celebration of love, managed to bring mortal enemies together as friends for a time. Just magical. I can't imagine what that was like. So I'd like to talk to you today about peace. And uh, lately we've been experiencing anything but peace, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, but that's something that we all really can look forward to right now is peace. And, uh, you know, this is not the first time in history that 
people were surrounded by chaos when they really wanted to be surrounded by peace. So let's go back to the manger scene. And uh, Josh is helping me, and he's going to put up some PowerPoints for me that I created for you so that you can see the scriptures. And I tried to put some pictures there in the PowerPoints, and in this first picture, there is a manger scene, and I was hoping to put the picture of the manger scene that my mom made, but um, it's too large a manger scene to be able to put into this PowerPoint. So the one that you're going to see is not the one that you've that my mom made for me, but hopefully I'll be able to show you a picture of that someday, and you'll be able to see the manger scene that's so special to me. But um, each person in the manger scene had plenty of reason to be stressed, as you can imagine. But let's see how each person in the manger scene was able to experience their own kind of peace on earth. We're going to start out with Mary. Let me read to you in Luke 1, 26 to 39. It says, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village of Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You have conceived and given birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, But how can this happen? I am a virgin. The angel replied, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she's now in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. So what was Mary's response to God's plan for her? Well, Mary turned over control of her own body to God's will. Now imagine finding out that you were all of a sudden pregnant. Just bam, <laughs> you're pregnant. And God had done this thing. And imagine explaining the whole thing to your neighbors and your family and your friends. <laughs> I mean... I would imagine that Mary had the option of saying no. Um, I'm sure God didn't force this on her. But you can imagine at the same time uh, what an awesome privilege that this was for Mary. Because this had been foretold for years that this was going to happen. And now all of a sudden, she's the one that's blessed of all women. And I'm sure that God knew when he picked Mary when he chose her to ask her to be the mother of the Christ child, what her answer would be. Because he knew his daughter well, and he knew what she would do and how she would respond. But uh, I'm sure it was really, you know, a major thing for her to have to experience. Now, think about Mary having to give control of her own body over to God and what that was like. And then let me ask you a question. Would God ever ask us to give control of our own body to him? Well, of course, not in the same way that he asked Mary to do that. But let me read a scripture for you in Romans 12, 1. It says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable, this is truly the way to worship him. So in a way, God does ask us to give control of our own bodies to him. Everything that we use our body to do, everything that our body is a part of, should bring glory to God in some way. We shouldn't allow our bodies to be a part of anything that would not bring honor and glory to God. Because we've given ourselves to him, not only our spirit, but our body, 
Every part of us we've given to him. Our entire life belongs to God. And for that reason, we want to worship him with everything that we say, everything that we do, everywhere that we go. With our bodies even, we want to worship God and we want him to be pleased with everything that we do. So in a way, we do give God control over our body the same way that Mary did. How about Joseph? Let's look at Joseph. That's in Matthew 1, 18 to 25. Let me read that. This is how Jesus, the Messiah, was born. His mother, Mary, was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her fiancé, was a good man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. So he, can, can, he considered this. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, Don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son. And you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through the prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born, and Joseph named him Jesus. Now, I'm sure that Joseph had a plan for he and his new bride before they even said their I do's. In those days, in the Jewish culture, the way that things would work is the young man would have everything all completed and all ready for his bride before he would even go and marry her and bring her home. He wanted everything to be perfect for his bride when she would arrive at her new home. He would have the furnishings, the house, everything all done, everything complete, everything that she would need to stay warm and comfortable, to make their meals, everything that she would need. She would come home to her new house and everything would be there, all ready for her to take up housekeeping and to enjoy being his wife and to enjoy their life together as husband and wife. And I'm sure that he did all kinds of work to get things ready for her arrival. And he was probably all excited about it. Now think about this. Jesus was raised in the same culture that Joseph was raised in. And what did he say to his bride? Let's look. John 14, 3. When everything is ready, I will come and get you, so that you will always be with me where I am. So Jesus has been getting everything ready for us, his bride, so that whenever it, the time comes for us to arrive home with him, everything will be all ready for us. Everything will be ready. And think about how long Jesus has been getting everything ready for his bride and what it's going to finally be like for us when we get there. You can only imagine. But when Joseph brought his bride home, he couldn't even consummate the marriage. He had to wait for all of that because he had to follow the will of the Lord and what the angel told him to do. And then in Matthew 2, 13 to 23, we find out, let's read it. It says, after the wise men were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, flee to Egypt with the child and his mother, the angel said. Stay there until I tell you to return because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. That night, Joseph left for Egypt with the child and Mary, his mother, and they stayed there until Herod's death. This fulfilled what the Lord had spoken through the prophet. I called my son out of Egypt. Herod was furious when he realized that the wise men had outwitted him. He sent soldiers to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were around two years and under, based on the wise men's report of the star's first appearance. Herod's brutal action fulfilled what God had spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A, prophet, a, a cry was heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning. 
Rachel weeps for her children, refusing to be comforted, for they are dead. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. Get up, the angel said. Take the child and his mother back to the land of Israel, for those who were trying to kill the child are dead. So Joseph got up and returned to the land of Israel with Jesus and his mother. But when he learned that the new ruler of Judea was Herod's son, Archelaus, he was afraid to go there. Then after being warned in a dream, he left for the region of Galilee. So the family went and lived in a town called Nazareth, and this fulfilled what the prophet had said, he will be called a Nazarene. So think about this. Jo Joseph had to get up, grab Mary and the baby, and flee to Egypt until... Until when? Until. He had no idea how long he was going to be there. The angel didn't say, flee for such and such amount of time, and then you can come back. He said, get Mary, the child, flee to Egypt until I tell you to come back. What's that? He had no idea how long he was going to be there. He just needed to go and just wait until. You know, sometimes the hardest thing that we hear from the Lord is wait. You know, um, we, we almost want to hear no sometimes when we ask for something more than we want to hear wait, because wait is a difficult thing, especially for us, because in our culture, we're, we're used to instant society. We're used to things happening just like that. Everything happens quickly. We don't want to wait for anything, but Joseph just had to go and wait until the angel told him to come back. So what does that mean? That means that Joseph had to turn over his future to God's will. He just had to say, okay, God, I put my future into your hands. And whatever you say, that's what I'll do. Would he ever expect us to do that? God ever expect us to put our future into his hands? You know what? As believers in Jesus... That's really what we're called to do. We're called not only to give him this moment in time, we're called to give him the rest of our moments of time. We're called to say, Christ, whatever you want me to do, I give my life to you. You call the shots from now on. And whatever you ask me to do, I'll gladly do. I give you not only this moment, I give you all my future moments because my eternity is in your hands. Amen. Well, how about the shepherds? What about those pieces to the manger scene? Let's look at the shepherds in Luke 2, 8 to 16. That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified. You can imagine angels showing up out of nowhere. They were terrified. But the angel reassured them, Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by the sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others. The armies of heaven praising God and saying, Glory to God in highest heaven, and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When the angel had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told, told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph. And there was the baby lying in the manger. Now let me point something out here. The angel says, Glory to God in highest heaven and peace on earth. To who? To everyone? No. Peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. If we want to experience peace on earth, and we can in the midst of all of the craziness, but if we want to experience that peace, we need to live a life that's pleasing to God. If we do that, we can experience peace no matter what kind of chaos is going on around us. 
Because of why? Because the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, will dwell in our midst. And in the middle of everything, we can experience peace when the Prince of Peace is with us. Amen. So the shepherds uh, had to just get up, leave their fields, and go and find the Messiah. Go and find their Savior. So what did they have to turn over to the Lord? They had to turn over their livelihood. Because <laughs> watching those sheep, that was their livelihood. That was their bread and butter. But they had to turn all of that over to God, to God and just give him control over all of that. Would he ask us to do that? <laughs> you know what? Ultimately, Christ is the one that takes care of us. But we don't have to be afraid of that because he's a good dad and he supplies all of our needs according to his riches and glory. So we don't have to be afraid of that. Amen? How about Simeon? He's another piece of the manger scene, if we have one of those extended large manger scenes. What about Simeon? Let's look at him in Luke 2, 25 to 32. It says, At that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous and devout, and was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come to rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him, and had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That day, the Spirit led him to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord as the law required, Simeon was there. He took the child in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace as you have promised. I have seen your salvation which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people Israel. The Holy Spirit had revealed to him that he was not going to die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. And he had been hanging on to that promise. Now, he was an old man, but he had been hanging on to that promise because he knew that when God promises you something, he fulfills his promise. So he knew that he would not see death until he saw the Lord's Messiah. He was hanging on to that promise. And now he had seen him. So now that he had seen him, what did he have to turn over to God? He had to turn over to God control of his purpose in life. Because he felt like his purpose in life was to see the Lord's Messiah. And that's the thing that he had been hanging on to for who knows how long. Because the Bible doesn't say he was waiting for this amount of time for that amount of time. I would imagine he was waiting for a long time. And he knew that that was part of his purpose. And so he had to turn his purpose over to control of God. You know what? Each one of us as believers in Jesus need to turn that control over to the Lord too. Because the Lord has a purpose for each one of us. He has a purpose for each one of you. You've been born with a destiny. God has something very special for you. There's something that he wants you to do and no one else. And he wants you to fulfill your destiny. I just encourage you to put your destiny into God's hands, into his control, and allow him to help you to fulfill your destiny and fulfill your purpose. Amen? Well, what about the wise men, the wise guys? Every time I th hear about the wise men, I think about uh, the Three Stooges. Ah, wise guys, huh? Nyah, nyah, nyah. But you have to be as old as me to remember them. So let's talk about the wise guys. We can find them in Matthew 2, 1 to 22. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, and was, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of the religious law and asked, Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? 
in Bethlehem and Judea, they said, for this is what the prophets wrote. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah. For a ruler will come from you who will be the, savior, the, the shepherd for my people Israel. Then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, Go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child. And when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went their way, and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child and his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasure chests and gave him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. When it was time to leave, they returned to their own country by another route, for God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. Now think about the trip that these guys had made. Um, from all of the studies that we do, we found out that they could have traveled as many as 500 to 1,000 miles to get to where they were traveling to. And it could have taken them as much as two years. Imagine the trip that they had taken. And what did they have to turn over to God, into God's control? Well, let's think about this. They had to turn their finances over to God. You can imagine how much it cost to finance a trip like that. They had to turn over their safety into God's hands. They had to turn over their comfort into God's hands. Imagine traveling 500 to 1,000 miles in two years on the back of a camel. Ouch, not comfortable. They had to turn over their hunger and their thirst. They had to turn over time spent with family and friends. They had to turn over their reputation. Because you can imagine when they told people that they were gonna go on this trip to follow a star, people probably thought, you guys are nuts, are you crazy? So they had to turn their reputation over to God and into his hands. And imagine everyday life just kept on going. Things didn't just stop just because they took this trip. Things kept right on going. So they had to turn over a lot of things to God and put things into his control. They had to just trust God for all of these things. Would we ever have to put those kinds of things into God's hands? Things like our finances, our safety, our comfort, our reputation, those kinds of things? Hmm. I think maybe we might. Now how about Jesus? Let's read about Jesus in Luke 22, 41 and 42. He walked away about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet, I want your will to be done, not mine. Now let's look in Luke 23, 41 to 46. We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man hasn't done a thing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. By this time it was noon and darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. The light from the sun was gone and suddenly the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn down the middle. Then Jesus shouted, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands or into your control. And with those words, he breathed his last. Jesus had to turn control of his glory and of his very life into the Father's will and into the Father's hands. Think about what Jesus had to leave to come to earth for us. He had to leave all the beauty, the glory, the splendor of heaven to come here. Revelations 21 verses 1 to 
Revelation 22, verse 7, described the beauty of heaven, all the things that he had to leave. He had to leave his father's side. He had to leave the saints. He had to leave the angels. He had to leave all those things. And by coming to earth as a human, Jesus had to take on certain limitations and weaknesses that he didn't have when he was in heaven. Think about it. Jesus was a timeless one. But he had to choose to be bound by time when he came to earth. He's omnipresent. He can be everywhere all the time. Psalm 139, 7 to 12 tell us that. There's no place in heaven, there's no place on earth that you can go that Jesus is not there. Yet during Jesus' earthly ministry, he had to choose to be bound by our three-dimensional time. He also had to take on the basic human needs that we experience that he never had to experience before. He had to take on hunger and thirst. He had to take on being tired and exhausted if he didn't get enough rest. He had to take on needing to be warm. He had to take on needing to have shelter and protection. He had to take on all the physical and emotional pain that we experience. He basically had to uncrown himself. I read a quote by William Dreyer. It said, to crown us and put off his robes to put on our rags. That's what he had to do. His sacrifice shows the length of his love for us and for all of humanity. And his highest sacrifice, of course, was the cross. But we shouldn't overlook all the things that Jesus had to leave behind when he left heaven to come to earth for us. As part of the Trinity, he has equal status with God the Father, but he didn't think so much of himself that he clung to his life and took advantage of his position. When it came time, he set aside all the privileges of his deity and he took on the status of a slave and became human for our sakes. In Philippians 2, 5 to 8, it says, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Alton Gangsky wrote this, Jesus leaving heaven is like a painter becoming a brush stroke on his own painting, or a playwright becoming a character in his own play. For some people, it is easier to imagine putting all the oceans on the earth in a teacup, or trapping the atmosphere in a bottle, than it is to understand that God would take on human form and walk this planet. Pretty cool way of putting it, isn't it? Well, let's talk about Herod. That's one piece of the manger scene that we haven't discussed yet. Matthew 2, 16. Herod was furious when he realized that the wise men had outwitted him. He sent soldiers to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under based on the wise men's report of the star's first appearance. Now think about this. We're talking about all the pieces of the manger scene. For all the other pieces of the manger scene, peace was the ultimate result. Mary in Luke 1, 28 and 30, Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Don't be afraid, Mary. The angel told her, For you have found favor with God. Joseph, Matthew 1, 20, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. The shepherds found their Messiah. Simeon saw the fulfillment of the promise that he had been given. The wise men found their newborn king. What might you have to give up? What kind of control might you or I have to give up and give over to God? Control of our body? Well, not like Mary did. But if the Lord asked us to be a missionary, 
We would have to give over control of our own body. We'd have to give up safety. That, that's the way it was for Jim Elliott. He was a very famous missionary in Ecuador. He, along with four other missionaries, and they ended up losing their lives on the mission field. But Jim Elliott was quoted by saying, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. You know, I was thinking about a young girl named Rachel Scott, 17 years old, and she died in the Columbine High School shooting. Why? Because she took a stand for Christ. She was quoted by saying, I am not going to apologize for speaking the name of Jesus even if I have to sacrifice everything. You know, folks, we don't have to go to some foreign country to have to give up our life. Rachel Scott was in her own high school, and because she took a stand for Christ and would not back down on the name of Jesus, she sacrificed everything. She inspired a movie that's called I'm Not Ashamed. You know, our country has changed a lot. And uh, it used to be to name the name of Jesus was um, something that you could do freely. But not everyone likes it when we name the name of Jesus. But whether they like it or not, Jesus is their only hope. He's the only hope they have for salvation. And we cannot hold back the name of Jesus to people who desperately need them. You know, people need Jesus and don't even need, know that they need Jesus. And it's, it's our calling to tell them about Christ. We've been given the Great Commission. We've been told that we should go to the uttermost ends of the earth if we need to, to preach the gospel. I don't know about you, I believe that Jesus is coming back soon. And there are still a lot of people that need to know about Christ. And that's our mandate, is to tell people about Christ, that He's the one that they've been searching for. He's the answer to all of their problems. He's the place where they can find hope. He's the place where they can find true peace. He's the place where they can find salvation. That's our calling, folks, is to let them know. We might have to give control of our future to Jesus. You know what? The future looks pretty bright whenever you give it to Jesus. Amen? We might have to give control of our livelihood to Christ, but there's no safer hands that we can put our livelihood into other than Jesus Christ. We might have to give control of our plans and our purpose into God's will. He has a plan for each one of us. We might have to give control of our finances, our safety, our comfort, our hunger and thirst, time with our family, everyday dealings of life, maybe even our reputation. You know what? Sometimes when you're witnessing about Christ, people might think that you're foolish. But you know what? The only way they're going to know about Jesus is if we tell them. One thing's for sure, whatever it is that we have to put into control into Jesus' hands, it's going to be worth it. I love that song, it's going to be worth it. One of my favorite songs, and it is going to be worth it, folks. I believe the time's coming soon, and we're going to find out just how worth it and it really is. Amen. There's only one person in the manger story that did not receive any peace from the events of that time. And it's the one who tried to hold on to everything rather than to give control over to Christ. And his name was Herod. The one thing that all the people in this story had in common that allowed them to have peace in the middle of a world where everything was changing around them was that they turned control of their lives and their circumstances into Christ's hands. Peace doesn't come any other way except by putting control into Christ's hands. Some people try to hang on to those reins of control, but peace only comes when we turn over those reins to the one who makes everything work out no matter your circumstances. In Isaiah 26.3, it says, 
you will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. That's how we have perfect peace. If you look at the people that Jesus encounters as they walk on earth, they all have a choice to make. And that choice is, am I going to give up control of my life? and put it into Jesus' hands? Or am I going to hold on to what I have with all my might because I'm afraid to let go for fear of what might happen or for fear of what I might lose if I turn those reins over into Jesus' hands? When Jesus told the fishermen to follow him, they left behind their families, their boats, their livelihoods, and they put all of that into Jesus' hands. And Jesus took those fishermen and he turned the world upside down with them. When Jesus had to feed 5,000, there was a young boy that gave up control of his lunch. Five biscuits and two fish. That boy gave up control of that lunch and put it into Jesus' hands. And what happened? The little boy himself and an entire crowd of people that day left with full bellies. But when Jesus told a rich young ruler to give up control of his riches and follow him, that man wouldn't let go control of the, the reins that he had, the grip that he had on his finances. And he went away sad, and he went away empty, and he went away lost. What are you refusing to release your grip on? What are you refusing to turn over control to Jesus? What's preventing you from finding peace during this season? Matthew 10, 39 says, If your first concern is to look after yourself, you'll never find yourself. But if you forget about yourself and look to me, you'll find both yourself and me. If you are not finding peace, maybe you're holding a little bit too tightly to the wrong things. Put your faith, your hope, and your trust in Jesus Christ because it's in Him where you'll find true peace. Amen. Let me close in prayer. Father, I thank you for my family, my friends, all those that are with me online in this moment and those that will be, that are going to listen to this in the future. God, I pray that during this season, they'll experience true peace. Father, if there's someone that is listening to me this morning that has not given their life to you, I pray that during this season, they will give their life to you and they will pray, pray this prayer with me during this time. Lord Jesus, I give over control of my life to you. I give you my life. I give you my destiny. I give you my purpose. Everything that I've held into my hands tightly, I now give to you, Lord Jesus. I ask you to take my life, to take control, and I give you my life. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I ask you to be my Savior and my Lord. I want to serve you the rest of my days. In your name we pray. Amen. And maybe you have given your life to Christ, but there's something you've been hanging on to, and you recognize that you need to give that to Jesus. Let's pray a prayer like that. Lord, forgive me for hanging too tightly on to the things that I've been holding on to. I haven't been willing to trust you. I don't know why, because you've never left me down. And so, Father, forgive me for holding on to that thing. I give it over into your hands right now, Lord God, and I ask you to take control. Father, use that thing and use me in whatever you, way you choose. In your name we pray. Amen. Father. I ask you to bless my friends. Merry Christmas. Have a wonderful holiday season. 
And may everyone that you love be blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. Merry Christmas.